We still have a minute, so if we don't bring to keep talking. <laughs> I'll make sure everybody online has a chance to, uh, to sign in. Tell me when, Michael. All right, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. I normally don't like to bring any notes up with me, but there are so many things to talk about today. I want to make sure that I don't forget something. So forgive me if I, if I stare down at a note occasionally. First, thank you for coming together this morning. Uh, things are continuing to go really well at the university, and it, I'm pleased to be able to give you this update. First, as always, I want to recognize our faculty who've had incredible success in uh, attaining external funding, which is really a sign of the quality of their work. Uh, so we have four individuals today. Um, one of those is Dr. Messmore, and then Dr. Rhoda. Dr. Rhoda, in fact, has two new grants, and she continues to excel as really been a leader in getting external funding uh, over the course of this year. We also have a faculty member who has received a K99 R00 grant, which is Dr. Um, Mayerl. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And then one of our students has also received a grant, um, and that is Mr. Jugwilian. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'd also like to recognize Dr. Coley. Many of you know that Dr. Coley has been heavily involved in Northeast Ohio Medical University uh, over the course of the last 20 plus years. He has spent 18 years as of September on our board of trustees. He kindly opened up his private golf course last Friday and invited people from across the university to come out and just participate and have fun. Uh, we had many students, we had staff, we had faculty, and it was a wonderful event. Dr. Coley continues to be a big advocate and supporter of Northeast Ohio Medical University. So I'm gonna ask that all of you who are able attend Dr. Coley's recognition event of his 18 years of service on our board of trustees on September 8th. Uh, an advertisement did go out in the email, we'll send you additional reminders. He's done so much for us, I'd love to have a big showing of our friends at Northeast Ohio Medical come together to recognize everything he's done for us as he ends 18 years of service on the board of trustees. I'd also like to ask that as many of you as possible come to the university on Saturday, September 11th. I know Saturday is the day you're not, most of us are not normally on campus, uh, but it will be the grand opening of the SUMA healthcare system on the Neomed campus. SUMA CEO will be here for a ribbon cutting ceremony. And at that day, they will be launching over 20,000 square feet of healthcare on the Neomed campus to include an urgent care facility and specialty care, which will include orthopedics, cardiology, endocrinology, psychiatry, family practice, corporate health, and the potential for women's health as well as others that will be growing here. I understand they've purchased a facility right across the street from Neomed and will open up a physical therapy department also. So we expect more of this expansion to occur on our campus as healthcare becomes a bigger part of the actual campus activities uh, above and beyond the education that we've done here so well for so many years. Excited to have that take place. If you can come and offer your support just to be there as part of the crowd, I think it's really important that we show SUMA just how much this means to us. We are currently planning an event to follow, uh, which will be a movie night or movie afternoon in this case. Now we ask that it be vaccinated individuals and we are asking for face masking and it'll be in the Watana Kunicorn Theater. We'll be playing the movie, Something the Lord Made. It's not a religious movie. It's a really outstanding movie about medical history, a true story. And a sub theme about this is racism in medicine in healthcare that has existed through uh, so many of our decades here in the United States but it's an outstanding movie with a very happy and wonderful ending and a true story. It's an opportunity for those of you who 
may have learned about or taught Tetralogy of Flow, a, a very complicated medical condition from a malformed heart, um, but it is a really truly wonderful piece of medical history in the United States and one that many surgeons look at and like to talk about degrees of separation from a key member of that movie, which is Dr. Alfred Blaylock. So I encourage all of you to come. We will be having food and refreshments. There's always a chance that we would cancel this last minute if the Delta variant really explodes here. But for now, we're feeling somewhat comfortable that by September 11th, we should be able to do this. This day was not picked because of the 20 year anniversary of September 11th. The tragedy occurred here in the United States. Um, so this is not meant to be disrespectful. We recognize the importance of this date. Uh, we just chose this in conjunction with the date that SUMA chose for being on our campus. So we will also recognize the, um, those who've lost their lives in the September 11th event at those activities. We're also looking to have casino night, which hasn't been he held here since October 2019. And that's a fundraiser for our free clinic, our SOAR clinic. In the past, it's been done as an internal event. We really wanna take this and grow it to a much bigger event to raise dollars to support those clinic activities in a bigger and better way. We also ask that if you're able to join us for that evening, which currently, as I understand it, is a James Bond theme evening because Dr. Alicia Bond is uh, the faculty member who runs that <laughs> clinic uh, and doing it after the Casino Royale theme for James Bond, where if you know anybody with high-end cars, Ferraris, Bugattis, Maseratis, <laughs> Lamborghinis, we're looking much like the real um, Monte Carlo Casino to have them on display in the front as people come off. Uh, come into the building and have fun. An evening of really fun is what it's meant to be. Not your typical fundraiser where you come in and mingle for 20 minutes and then sit at a table with eight other people while somebody speaks, but just an evening to depress and have fun. We really believe that the Delta variant will be dramatically down and this will be an opportunity for us all to come together by November 5th and to support the free clinic. So if you're able, uh, please join us. The other event that is being planned is for October 4th. As you know, we lost Dr. Jay Gershon about one year after he retired. And his uh, widow has been working with us to raise money for Jay Gershon scholars for underrepresented minorities in both medicine and in pharmacy. During the pandemic, we did raise some dollars, uh, not as many as we'd have liked. I think we were at about 25,000. Uh, that event, we're going to recognize the three first Jay Gershon scholars. Uh, we are going to share the great diversity information that has grown out of this university through your hard work over the course of the last two years with the community. We'll have our diversity and equity council there and we will be working with Carol Can and Jay's uh, widow to raise additional funds uh, through their friends and neighbors uh, to continue to support these scholarships. So if you're able to attend that, please do look for that uh, to be in further announcements uh, coming to you very soon. September 2nd will be our new vital series for this year, a very successful program in leadership in healthcare that we ran over the course of last year. The vitals, first vital se section will take place on November 2nd at noon. And we are very honored to have a former US legislator and certainly a name that all of us in America recognize, uh, Patrick Kennedy uh, come to speak to us about behavioral health issues in the United States. And we'll have a special guest um, help to mediate this section uh, this session from PEGS Foundation. So really excited to have um, now doctor, because he's a doctor honoris with us, Rick Keller here for that event also. Um, we are also having a soft launch of our new faculty development program take place on September 1st. We made a promise that one of the areas we're going to focus on is faculty development at this university to help our great faculty members become better, 
to improve their capabilities and to help achieve excellence in teaching and in research in leadership and through mentorship. I really am proud of the work that's come together under Dr. Rick Kasmer and Janelle Kolner. Their efforts over the last nine months have allowed us to build out substantial new programs. The initial launch will be Academic Impressions. Academic Impressions is a national organization that has been touted by some of the most premier universities in the United States, including Johns Hopkins, Case Western Reserve, uh, some of the universities of California. It's an outstanding program with great training opportunities, and it'll be available to all of our faculty and also to our staff, as there are numerous staff training opportunities in it. For those of you who are looking for a tool to become better at what you do to build your careers, we're excited to get this launched. There will be training offered here so that you can learn how to use the tool adequately. In addition to that, we're going to reinvigorate the Master Teachers Guild. We're expecting a reunion of that organization in October, and we have many more, many more opportunities that will be coming uh, over the course of this year. We have dedicated $100,000 a year to faculty development and expect that we'll be increasing that amount. And it's really just to respond to your needs and to help you blossom in your careers and be better at what you do if those are the tools that you're looking for. I know Dr. Kasmer is also planning to build out a mentorship network, as well as many of our opportunities through this programming. I expect that there's going to be, um, including in this, there's going to be some mini series, uh, including one on uh, diversity in education and in medicine, as well as some uh, research symposiums that will take place. November 19th, I'm told, we'll be also having our research day where our students who've been conducting research with faculty on our campus, as well as our clinical faculty, will present their work. This is being sponsored through the Vice President for Research Office. We'll have more coming out on that. But you can see we have a lot taking place on this campus. We really are back to where we once were a little bit modified, a little bit safer for sure around COVID, uh, but all of our activities that we're used to are returning to this campus. The white coat ceremonies are now done for the year. We had incredible participation. The last one with the College of Pharmacy was just incredibly enjoyable seeing the smiles and the engagement of the new students and their family members who were here on our campus. We've launched new programs. I'm, I'm pleased to say that the Masters in Leadership and Health System Sciences uh, initial class has officially started. Our College of Medicine, our College of Pharmacy, our other master's programs are in place, including our Modern Anatomical Sciences program. And we're still very um, hopeful that our new master's that will create certified anesthesia assistants will be on track to be accredited and be able to launch its first class in January of this year. So a lot of growth, a lot of things taking place on this campus and it's all due to your actions. So thank you for everything that you're doing to make it successful. We uh, do have more scrutiny coming our way. Many of you know, we got through the LCME, LCME uh, and I want to thank, again, Dr. Young and her team for doing such an outstanding job. We are now fully accredited, but it's also time for our 10-year <laughs> review in September of 2022 through our broader accreditation body, which is HLC, or Higher Learning Commission. So I'll be meeting with our steering committee for, for that accreditation later today. I do want to thank those who support that, especially Deb Loyette, Jordan Sindrich, and for the entire team of leaders across this campus who are being led by our chair, uh, Dr. Winstrup, to help us get through this accreditation in a very successful manner. I think we're set up for success. We've already accomplished several of the um, topics that need to be covered and uh, have a good and early start on a successful accreditation. So I think we're gonna be in really good shape for that. I also want to thank Dr. Kasmer as our Vice President for Academic Affairs for the work that he's done in that area. 
we are, are now allocating the remainder of the HERF dollars or the money that we received around COVID for our students from the federal government. That third and final distribution, at least as far as we know, that's going to be the final distribution from the federal government, will be providing dollars to close to 300 students on the Neomed campus. We're going to get an average of about $1,076 a piece. It's based on those who have need. Uh, and have specific financial debt. But I wanna thank uh, Mary Taylor and her team for helping to get that out so we're able to help our students. This is the third distribution over the course of the pandemic. We've been able to provide dollars that ranged anywhere from 500 to well over $2,000 to our students in need. Uh, we have to thank the federal government certainly for that, but also Mary's team for their ability to come together and help us determine the best way of distributing those funds which need to go to our students to support them. This time, I'd also think it's really important that all of us acknowledge, um, we can't recognize every international tragedy, but I think we all need to, to note that our, our hearts and our, our prayers are with those in Afghanistan, especially as we're coming upon the 20th anniversary of September 11th, which led to us being in Afghanistan for almost 20 years. Uh, I think the images that we've seen on the news and in social media have been appalling and saddening. Uh, we know many have lost their lives. So especially to the veterans out there who've served and to the family members of the veterans who didn't come home, our hearts are with you. Finally, for me, an update on COVID-19. So I'm very happy to tell you that we've had zero new cases on this campus. We continue to be a very, very safe place to be. But we are where we're at because of the incredible work of our COVID-19 safety team. Dr. Joe Zarconi, Dr. Eric Kostovsky, uh, Mr. Jesse Zampedro, um, really our hats are off to you for all the great work that you've done. They went over and above far more than our local health department required from us, tracking safety on this campus, ensuring vaccines were available, testing, keeping you all informed, even if there was a chance you might've been exposed to somebody, letting you know that there was a chance and you may want to look more carefully or whether you had symptoms or whether you wanted to seek additional testing. We can't thank them enough for what they've done for well over a year now. We're moving into a new phase. They've informed me today that our total vaccination rate has continued to go up. If you average where we are based on students in the different colleges uh, relative to their size, as well as our faculty and staff, we are at almost 97% vaccinated as a campus. 92% in holding for our faculty and staff, College of Medicine at 99% for the students, but 96% for our College of Pharmacy, and more recently at 100% for our MAS students who are part of the College of Graduate Studies. So we've done an amazing job. No other university comes close to this. I meet with the IUC presidents frequently. I've had two meetings over the last two weeks regarding the vaccine mandates that are coming out uh, after the FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine. So we are in incredibly good shape. Based on that, we've made modifications. We're going to thank Dr. Stavke and Dr. Zarconi for their incredible work and allow them to go back to the work that they'd been doing before that had, uh, they've given up in order to be able to do this. We feel we're to the point that we can be much more automated with uh, Mr. Zampedro and any assistance that he needs to continue moving forward. So you notice that there was a, an email went out with links. There will be more following. Uh, an FAQ has been created just to walk people through what we do and how we do it. If you think you may have been exposed and you're vaccinated, if you're asymptomatic, nothing you need to do. Uh, if you are symptomatic, then we're going to ask you to stay home and to get tested. But all of this is laid out in a very simple if-then statement process for all of us to follow. We are going to follow suit with the other universities in the state. 
Many of you know that Ohio State University, University of Akron, Kent, and many others have already come out with a vaccine requirement. Neomed will be doing the same. Our plan, which we will be announcing formally over the course of the next 24 hours, is that we will have a requirement for attendance in our university or for employment at the university that everyone be vaccinated no later than December 17th. That's a Friday. Now this is Ohio and we follow Ohio law. So there is an opportunity for those with religious exemptions, with medical exemptions, and those with exemptions due to matters of conscience to be able to be waived from the vaccine requirement. We've done so well, that tells me that getting beyond the 96.8% that we're at as a whole on this campus is going to be very difficult because we're in such great shape. But we do recognize that there are individuals out there who cannot be vaccinated for reasons again, medical, religious, or matters of conscience. So we will have those waivers available and we're going to work with them either through um, Sandra Ambrick's office for our students or through HR for our faculty and our staff. Thank you for everything that you've done. We truly are um, leading all of the Ohio institutions and probably every institution in the state given the vaccine rate we've achieved. It's substantially higher than our hospital systems have been able to achieve. And it just shows that this university stands behind the science that we teach our students in healthcare. Vaccines do work and they are safe. With that, I'm going to stop. And before we get to questions, I wanted to open up the floor to uh, Jordan Sindrich uh, to provide uh, some discussion points on a COVID-19 remembrance program. My microphone. You can. This is your Zoom. You can certainly use it when I have. Thank you, Dr. Landel, for giving me just a few moments today. Uh, good morning, everyone. I represent a much larger group that consists of faculty, uh, staff, and administrators uh, in the uh, president's office uh, to report on some work that's been done over the last uh, few months uh, to plan a campus wide COVID reflection event. Earlier this year, Dr. Chris Boffman and a group of faculty members in the Exceptional Faculty Experience Group, or EEG, came up with an idea to give the Neomed community the chance to reflect on an individual and uh, collective experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic. At the time, it seemed likely that we would all be coming back to campus this semester for the start of the academic year, and that it would be appropriate for each of us to have the opportunity to share our grief our thanksgivings and hope for the future as we return, whatever it is that you may desire to express with others in our community. For many of us, the safety restrictions put in place during the pandemic took these opportunities away from us to gather to grieve the loss of loved ones, celebrate birthdays, graduations, and weddings together with our family and friends. So the Exceptional Faculty Experience Group, along with several members of the Neo Med Administration, brainstormed ideas to create a space for faculty, staff, and students to come together for that purpose. Admittedly, we were afraid that this type of event would give the wrong signal that we all thought that the pandemic was over and we could all go back to doing things as normal. Uh, and we hope that that's not the impression that the community gets from this. Uh, we know that the surge of the Delta variant is uh, putting us in a place that we know we're not out of the woods yet. Nevertheless, with the start of the new academic year and all of us back on campus, it remains appropriate for us to pause for some reflection on how far we've come as a community and as individuals. My message today is uh, just to please stay tuned and to look for opportunities to engage with this event while planning is still underway. Current ideas include sharing artistic reflections of the pandemic uh, with the artists and medicine student group at the helm of that uh, with Dr. Bracken. Uh, interactive boards for members of the community to publicly share their thoughts and feelings, and also working with Marcom for some multimedia opportunities to memorialize friends and family members that have been lost during the course of the pandemic. So thank you all for listening, and I hope you consider supporting this event once more messaging comes out for the group. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to contact me 
or for faculty members, feel free to work with your representative to the faculty council. Thank you. Thank you, George. I was told by um, Michael Wright that I speak too loudly. It was overwhelming the mic, so I'm going to not use it this time. <laughs> Thank you. But let's open this up for questions uh, or dialogue. Anything from the uh, audience here? Yes. So that's that will be provided if we know that the recommendations are uh, completely appropriate. There's still a lot of debate as to whether the data that was shared um, by the federal government, which came from the Israeli studies, is correct or not. So I'm not sure that it's still considered completely appropriate to get the boosters. Some people are getting them. It's mostly recommended for those who are at risk. And it's eight months after your second dose of the initial vaccines that were, read, were, were provided. So for those who were vaccinated early, most early groups maybe received a second dose by February. So that's gonna take us somewhere in the neighborhood of October. So if it's appropriate, uh, it, then we will make sure that it's offered to uh, people. The ability to do that on this campus becomes much, much easier now that we have this partnership with SUMA and they'll be open at the time. Oh. <laughs> okay, Michael. <laughs> yes. Okay. Other questions from the audience here? Craig? Is there, is there an update on as to when the flu vaccine will be available here at Neomed? I don't have that information. Dr. Kasmer? So it's, it's ordered every January. It only arrives in the September, October timeframe. So maybe within the next one to two months. Okay. So Dr. Kasmer tells us it's been ordered. It should be available in the next one to two months. Uh, it's the time it's normally available for us, September, October timeframe. And we are going to continue to require the flu shot on the campus as we've done in the past. Other questions in the audience here at Neomed? Anything online? Just if uh, we can repeat the first question about the booster. So the first question was, is there a booster shot for COVID-19 which will be available on this campus as had been recommended? What I shared is that the recommendations are still not solid at this time. Um, it's likely, but not guaranteed that th that booster will be recommended for everybody who's received the vaccine. At this time, it is eight months after your second dose which was all that was available at the time for Moderna or Pfizer. So that's going to put us at least into October for people on this campus, maybe beyond. And if it remains an appropriate recommendation, then we will ensure that those booster shots are available to our community. Michael, anything else? No further questions. No further questions. Well, thank you once again, as we um, do our best to return to a new state of normal on this campus, I'm thrilled that we are here, our students are here and that we are remaining safe. And ultimately that we've had zero new cases over the last week. Well, the Delta variant has uh, had pretty big impact on other parts of the state. It just shows that our vaccine status here does make a difference. Thank you everyone.